Hi, I'm Heather Nani. Today we're talking about Picnic at Hanging Rock, the 1967 novel written by Australian author Joan Lindsay. Please, if you like this video, like and subscribe. So we'll start with just a brief overview of what this story is about. First of all, it is an incredibly atmospheric, eerie tale of missing children and, and an instructor. The novel starts out with a students enrolled at the Appleyard College for Girls going off on a hot summer day. It takes place in 1900, as a matter of fact, on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1900. This book was set in Australia. That's why it's summertime when the story takes place. So the girls go to these picnic grounds, to Hanging Rock, which is an actual location in Victoria. It is a volcanic formation that's six million years old. It's a popular recreational tourist site. So anyway, the girls go there for a picnic and four of them decide to go and take a walk and explore and three do not come back. A teacher also goes off to explore the rock and doesn't come back either. One of the girls runs down screaming, terrified that something that the other girls that she was walking with had gone further up the mountain, the girls that were lost. Later they discover another one of the missing girls. But what we're left with is two missing schoolgirls and a missing instructor. Now the way Lindsay wrote this book, which is so fascinating, is she told it as if it was a true story. And people to this day still think there's some truth behind the story of the um, picnic at Hanging Rock, but there's really nothing to support that claim. Um, people still go to Hanging Rock wondering what happened to the missing schoolgirls. As a matter of fact, that's led to um, quite a bit of frustration over the fact in a movement called uh, Miranda Must Go due to the fact that there's so much concern over these lost fictional girls, white lost fictional girls, when in fact indigenous people that lived in that area had been displaced by European settlers, um, their children had been killed and lost. But when you look at this novel, this novel is very much about colonialism. It's very much about people being in a place that they have absolutely no understanding of it and as much as they want to control everything, they can't. This, move, this movie, this, we'll get to the movie, this book is dense, it's, short, it's small, but it's dense in theme. Um, it talks about, it addresses, we already addressed colonialism, repression of women, um, how repressive, even though this takes place in 1900, yeah, 1900, the headmistress still adheres to the old Victorian values and how repressive that could be. It um, addresses the or revolves around that whole lost child theme that you find in so much of the Australian literature and films. Ultimately, this is about the convergence of nature and the natural and the spiritual world and how absolutely powerful that is over the artifice of man. As much as the characters would like to have control over their settings, there is something that's greater at work. That is not necessarily good, however. It leads to deaths. It leads to fires. It controls your dreams and nightmares. Um, sometimes something good happens from it as a result. But, well, we'll get more into the story itself and we'll see how that theme plays out. But before I go any further with that, let's talk about Lindsay herself. Lindsay is an interesting lady. She was born in 1886 in Australia. She came from a prominent family. Her dad, I believe, was a barrister. Her maternal grandfather was the governor of Tasmania. She went to, and I believe I said before, Clyde Girls Grammar School, which served as 
inspiration for the setting for Apple Yard College. She was not just only a writer and a playwright, but before that she was a painter. And this is very important to note. She went to the National Gallery of Victoria Art School. She studied painting under Frederick McCubbin. And if you take a look at his works, he's quite a famous Australian artist. His works are ethereal, they're hazy. Um, he was part of the Australian, Australian Impressionist movement. There is this kind of claustrophobic feeling in a lot of his work where you have European settlers juxtaposed with the natural world, which can be so crushing and dangerous. He is, one of his famous paintings was Lost, which I think, if I could dig through these cards and find the date, but I think it was 1886, he painted Lost or Lost Child, where there is a child lost in the, in the woods. It's hard to find images of Lindsay's paintings, but from what I've seen, there is a similar aesthetic. Her work, again, has that hazy, dreamlike quality. And when you read, as you've read, Picnic at Hanging Rock, it's a very dreamy book. And it's almost as if she painted the story rather than wrote it. It's so visual. And what's interesting is when we talk about the Peter Ware film, he really followed the guidelines set by Lindsay in the novel because the film is very, at least for me, was very close to how I visualized it, and I visualized it just based going strictly with what Lindsay herself had written on the page. Um, so let's talk about the story. We have these girls that, the students that go to the, um, oh no, I didn't talk about Lindsay's marriage. Lindsay married um, Daryl Lindsay, who was an artist. He was the director of the National Gallery of Victoria. He was knighted for his services for the arts. And he, um, she was known as a mystic, Lindsay, not known as a mystic, she was a mystic. She was very much into spiritualism, something that she kept, not necessarily hidden, but that she didn't really discuss much with her husband. He likely wouldn't have approved of that. Lindsay, it is said that she could not wear watches, that she, when she was around clocks, they would stop. You see this happen over and over again in Picnic at Hanging Rock. Um, it is said that she um, could see, she could foresee the future, she could see spirits. So that kind of moves us into the conversation of how she wrote Picnic. Now, she had mentioned this, I believe his name was Colin Caldwell, Caldwell, her friend, in 1963 that she wanted to write this particular story. Um, and they went to Hanging Rock when she talked about the story with him. And Caldwell said that she could see things in the landscape that other people just couldn't see. Now, in 1966, Lindsay woke up one morning and told her housekeeper, I believe her name was Ray, that she had a dream and she was going to write it down. And that dream is this story, Picnic at Hanging Rock. By mid-afternoon, she had the plot written, mapped out. And then it took her only two weeks to finish writing the novel. But um, she had said that for about a week, she continued to have dreams of this story which again might account for some of the dreamy quality of the story itself when you read it. So anyway, the novel itself. Again, quickly, we have these schoolgirls. We have um, Irma Leopold, who is an heiress. We have Marion Quaid, who's a very studious mathematics student. We have Miranda, and interestingly enough, we don't have a last name for Miranda. Miranda is this beautiful, angelic, kind, lovely student that is lost along with the other two. And we have Edith Horton, a younger girl that takes a walk up the mountain, up Hanging Rock with these older girls. And as they're walking up this Hanging Rock, there's some other picnickers that 
and two boys. It's the Fitz, Fitzhubert family, husband, wife, their nephew, Michael Fitzhubert, and also their coachman, um, what's his name, and Albert Crandall. And Albert whistles at the girls as they're hiking away, and Mike reprimands him, says, oh, you can't treat girls that way. But then afterwards, Mike goes to follow the girls, just for a short way. And so when the girls go missing, there's a period of time in the novel where I think a lot of us thought, did those boys have anything to do with these girls that go missing? Now, let me stop here and tell you something that's really important to know if you don't already. Lindsay wrote a final chapter to this book, the 18th chapter. That explains exactly what happened to the missing girls. And it is very much incorporates Aboriginal um, spiritualism. Now, her editor, her, the assistant editor, her editor was John Hooker, Hooker, I believe, and the assistant editor was Sandra Forbes at um, FW Cheshire Publishing. And Forbes told her she read the book, she liked it, and she convinced Lindsay to leave out that final chapter because what the story really needed was ambiguity. And it is, Lindsay agreed, and she pulled that final chapter out, and that's what makes this book so fascinating because Lindsay, it's so tightly constructed, the story, there's so many clues about what happens to these girls, but you wouldn't believe what really happens to these girls unless you read that final chapter. So it's an interesting, um, I'll ask you at the end, because I'd like to know if you enjoy the ambiguity of the story, not knowing what really happened to them. I know the movie got a lot of pushback because people wanted an actual solid ending, a solution to the missing girls. Now, setting of the story, 1900s. These girls are dressed in long, white dresses, high-necked, even though it's a very hot summer day, they have to wear their hats and their gloves and their kid boots, more of an Edwardian style than a Victorian style, but they are wearing corsets. So you have this sense as you're reading it in the beginning, people are hot, they're tired. After the girls have their picnic, they're napping. Sorry, I jumped back. This is before they go for the hike. And you get this kind of oppressive sense, like, oh, you can't really enjoy this picnic. It's so freaking hot and you're way too overdressed. But as the girls go to hike, they decide to take off their shoes. Mike Fitzhubert notices that. Um, Edith Horton won't take off her shoes, and that's important to know. We're going to talk about that later. Um, so anyway, the girls start hiking. And before they did, another very important point to note is that anyone that had a watch, the watches stopped at noon. So the man who drove them to the picnic site, I think his name is Ben Hussey, his clock stops. Now the picnic site was about three hours away from the college that they, from Apple Yard College, and the headmistress told them, make sure you're back by eight, which I mean, they were planning on leaving it like on the early at four, just in case. So they really had to be paying attention to time. Um, Greta McGraw, the mathematics instructor that also goes missing a little bit later, looks at her watch, her watch has stopped dead. Now, then they ask Miranda, Miranda, what about your pretty little diamond watch? And Miranda says, this is the ethereal beauty, says, mm, no, I don't like to wear that anymore. I didn't like the ticking close to me. So she's, she doesn't have a watch. So anyway, girls go up, we know they have limited time to explore this rock. There comes a moment where they, um, well, before they nap, Little Edith, the younger one, doesn't like the rock. She is frightened by the silence of the area. She, they start talking about how old the rock is, that it's millions of years old. And she is frightened by that. She asks the girls to stop talking. She really is clearly a, char a character that does not belong in that setting. Anyway, the girls get very, very tired. You know it's getting later because so much of this book, and of course it speaks to Lindsay being an artist, is about light and shadow. 
and the light is changing, the shadows are casting in different places. You know that it's getting too late for the girls to still be on that rock. But at one point, they just decide to nap. And you see this happen throughout the book. It's like people are just lulled to sleep. And as they're napping, there's bugs crawling over them. There's lizards. All of a sudden, the girls wake up and Miranda just starts to go and walk away further into the mountain. And Edith is yelling for the girls, don't go, she's scared. And the girls just go. They just walk away without their shoes. And Lindsay notes that it looked almost like they were floating rather than walking. And that's the last we see of Miranda and Marion Quaid. Irma follows them. Edith, terrified, runs down screaming back to the picnic site. Anyway, at one point, the mathematics instructor got up and she goes missing. Nobody sees her. And that's it. The girls get back to Apple Yard College. It is extremely late. It's like 10.30 at night. And then the rest of the story is really about what happens to these girls and the, cons and, and, and the after effects of, of, of their going missing. Now, let's talk about some other themes that we see in this book. This rock casts a shadow over the whole story. And everyone, even tangentially involved in the story, is really impacted by whatever force of nature that is. Um, Lindsay starts to talk about, and at a certain point, I feel that the novel moves from more of this kind of painterly style to it gets a little more heavy-handed where Lindsay now has to explain how there's these patterns that, that the rock has caused, that it's moving like a wave through the lives of all the characters in this book. Now, it results in fires, in nightmares, in potentially murder of Sarah Wayborn, and some good fortune as well. But before we get, actually I wanna focus on time, because I didn't talk much about that other than the watches stopping, but time is such an important theme in the movie, and our artificial kind of construct of time with watches instead of measuring it with lights and shadows. And even the Apple Yard College has this Lindsay describes it as an Italianate, an Italianate mansion. And these mansions kind of cropped up throughout Australia after people had discovered gold there. It's out of place. Um, the furnishings are Victorian. There's classical sculptures in the building. It has this, what I would even say is it lends to the Gothic feel of the novel. There's something off even about the location. Um, of this, of the setting of this building, and it's of a time and a place that doesn't belong where it is. Um, let's see, what else have I missed here? We see, after the girls go missing, that people start having nightmares. Mike Fitz, uh, Fitzhubert, who was the boy that followed the girls, starts to have nightmares. Albert Crandall, the coachman, starts to have, actually has a very peculiar nightmare, but that speaks to another character in the novel, Sarah Wayborn. Sarah Wayborn is not allowed to go on the picnic with the other girls. She's probably the most tragic character in this story. The headmistress, Miss Appleyard, absolutely hates Sarah Wayborn. There's something Again, speaking to time, at one point in the novel, Sarah says, I feel like I'm a million years old. She doesn't belong with this woman, this headmistress. She doesn't belong in this place. She is an orphan. And basically what the headmistress does throughout the novel is becomes increasingly cr um, cruel to this character of Sarah Wayborn. And Sarah Wayborn ends up dead. Now, I believe 
that Sarah Wayborn was likely was murdered by Mrs. Apple Yard, just based on the condition in which her body was found. However, there's a possibility that she had committed suicide because of the cruel treatment she was facing. It's possible that um, Mrs. Appleyard had murdered her over time by poisoning her. Whatever the case is, Albert Crandall, 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 sorry, who was with Mike Fitzherbert, Fitzhubert, had a sister. He's also, a, not really, well, yeah, an orphan. The parents abandoned them when they were young. And Albert talks about his sister. Um, they were split up. He said that at one point the sister was younger than him. Um, she, was she married to an older man? There was something with an older man. And um, he hoped his sister was well. One night, Albert's sister comes to him in a dream, and he smells pansies, which I didn't know pansies could smell. I never thought they did, but he talks about pansies smelling, and his sister shows up, and she says goodbye to him in, in his dream. Shortly either before or after that, we find out that Sarah Wayborn at the college had been murdered, and one of her favorite flowers was pansies. And you realize that Joan, like I said, the story is really tightly written, that Sarah, those clues were planted that Sarah was Albert's, Albert's um, sister that died tragically. Um, you have another headmistress, not headmistress, instructor at the school, Dora Lumley, who quits the school because after the girls are not discovered, the reputation of this girls' college starts to spiral downward, leading the headmistress, Mrs. Appleyard, to madness. And so people start are starting to quit and find other jobs. Dora Lumley quits. Her brother picks her up. They spend the night in a hotel and she is burnt to death in a fire. At the end of the story, we find out that a fire actually ends up consuming the college after it was closed and destroys the whole thing. Again, nature just destroying something that didn't belong there. Um, and the end of the story brings us to, they do find one of the girls, Irma Leopold, and something I didn't, I forgot to bring up, is when they found Irma, she was without her corset. And she was scratched and a little bloody, but that her feet were perfectly untouched. Then we find out that Greta McGraw, the school teacher that went up to hike up the mountains with the other girls, when the other girls went, when Edith Horton ran down the hill, she saw Greta McGraw, McGraw without her, um, without her skirt on. So there is this also the shedding throughout the story of clothing. There's this almost people becoming more natural before they disappear. So, the end of the story, we have Irma back, we have the two other girls missing, we have a dead Sarah Wayborn, we have a dead Dora Lumley, and the headmistress at the end of the story, she had never been to Hanging Rock, she goes off to Hanging Rock, and she is met with the phantom, the ghost of Sarah Wayborn, and then she goes and she jumps off the rock and dies herself. As she is heading Mrs. Appleyard up the up hanging rock, you really get the sense of this is a woman that does not belong here at all. She's wearing her Victorian because she's still dressed in a Victorian style. All those clothes going up this mountain in this high heat. Um, and I did want to bring up a quote from the book. In the beginning, when the girls are at the picnic, it says, Lindsay had said, described all these girls at the picnic, um, insulated from natural contacts with earth, air, and sunlight by corsets, pressing on the, the solar plexus by voluminous petticoats, cotton stockings, and kid boots, the drowsy, well-fed girls lounging in the shade were no more a part of their environment than figures in a photograph album arbitrarily posed against a black black cloth back cloth of cork rocks and cardboard trees so again throughout this novel we have people in a place they don't belong we have this 
weird thing happening with clocks in time. We have this rock that's always casting shadows. We have this people that are always being lulled to sleep and there is a force at work that is beyond everyone's control. Now, let's talk about the final chapter. And like I said, it's going to seem probably unexpected, but remember Lindsay's, that Lindsay was into spiritualism. And what she does in her final chapter is she borrows from the Aboriginal, from Aboriginal spiritualism to account for what happens to the missing girls. This is what happens. They, Greta McGraw, the teacher, meets Miranda, Irma, and um, Marion Quaid at the top of the hill, and they don't recognize her. She transforms herself into a crab, leads them through a wormhole, where I believe they were met by some sort of lizard, man king, that leads them into another dimension where the girls transform into animals. 1.2, they take off their corsets, the corsets are floating in the air. But now this, and I'm not gonna get too into it because I don't know enough about Aboriginal belief, but I can say that animal transformation was part of that. It's also important to note that of the, I think, over 100 language, different Aboriginal languages, there is no word for time. And so we really, Lindsay does tie this up, again, with people in a place they don't belong, and how on that rock, three were absorbed into this natural, spiritual realm. And the rest were really left to fate. Now, I don't know if I spoke much about this being a considered a Gothic novel. Um, it is definitely an Australian Gothic novel, which is different from what we think here when we think of maybe Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca, or you think of dark and stormy nights and castles and thunder and lightning and houses falling apart and ghosts. Australian Gothic is different in that it is people where the, where the what's not controlled is the landscape. And that is absolutely what this novel is. People cast in a landscape that they have no control of. Of course, Gothic also involves decay morally. When we look at Mrs. Appleyard and the decay of her character and the cruelty that she inflicts and as she gets crueler and crueler as the story moves on. Um, now, Peter Weir's film, and we can't not talk about that, was well, the film was released in 1975, but in 1971, Patricia Lovell, who was a television presenter, approached Lindsay about making her book into a novel, I mean, into a movie. And Lindsay agreed at some point in 1973. Lovell suggested Peter Weir, who wasn't well known, he was only 27 years old at the time, um, that he direct the film. Lindsay met with them. Um, Lovell noted that when they met, Lovell's watch stopped, and that happened repeatedly throughout the filming of the, of the movie. Um, like I said, Weir was faithful to the text and the descriptions that um, Lindsay had, had, had written. The rock itself, they had planned on filming the movie in the Blue Mountains, but when they went to the rock, they said, no, this has to be the location. Now. The location, when you look at the mountains in the movie where you get to actually see the rock, it's very eerie. The rocks seem to have faces. Um, I couldn't imagine being able to recreate that setting anywhere but actually do it in the place where it was really supposed to be set. Um, Weir, Lindsay had told Weir, don't ask me the ending, what the ending is. Don't ask me what happened to the girls. And Weir said he did once and she wouldn't tell him. And um, according to where he never found out the ending, which is really interesting because he too plants the seed of something more mystical happening to the, mystic, to the missing girls, um, even without having known um, the ending, that 18th chapter. Now, Roger Ebert 
immediately identified that film as one of the greatest films. Gene Siskel, however, didn't like it. He didn't like when he first watched it. He did not like the ambiguity of that ending. He felt like the audience was cheated. I don't know if he read the book, because then he would certainly feel cheated um, without that final chapter. But when he, when, when Siskel saw the movie again in, I think it was re-released, it might have been 1995, um, he took that back and conceded that it was a great film. So interestingly, and if you watch the film, Ware wanted this Australian impressionistic feeling to the, to the look of the movie. Now again, um, Joan Lindsay studied under Frederick McCubbin, who was an Australian impressionist. And the way Ware got this kind of hazy look to the movie was he worked with um, French photographer, um, what is it, was it? Henri Cartier-Bresson, I believe. And he taught him to put veils over the lens, so it really created this muted, dreamlike quality. So, um, the film is pretty faithful to the book. I think if you just watch the film and not read the novel itself, you're going to feel disappointed only in that there's so much, like I said, in this small book that I couldn't possibly discuss, you know, during this one video that you miss if you only watch the movie. So if you've watched the movie, go back and read the book. If you've read the book, watch that Ware film because it's really quite good. And I know there was a new film that was out, I think in 2018, a BBC um, version of Hanging Rock that I believe is um, a made for TV series, I don't know, but I have to check that out. In the meantime, please tell me what you feel about the ending of the novel. Do you think it needed that 18th chapter? Um, if you want to read the 18th chapter, it was published posthumously. Um, I forget what year, but it is called Secret at Hanging Rock, so you can get your hands on that 18th chapter and read it. So let me know what you think about the ending. I'm also curious what you think about if you've seen both the movie and read the book, um, how, which one you preferred. So let me know, and again, if you like this, please like and subscribe, and until next time.